hammer and destroy. We will hammer and destroy. And God has brought a warrior here. The Lord told me particularly to invite her. The ministers were already set. So I was praying one day and the Lord told me, you must invite Dr. Laura Harris. Wow. And then the Lord said, she is one of my warriors. Many people don't know, but she's one of my warriors. So I call her and ask her, I heard you are a warrior. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, then I invited her to her, and as God has been gracious to us, she was ready to give up everything to be here. Amen. Hallelujah. The husband is not here because they had a program in the family where both of them had to be there, but she had to take off, let the husband go so that she can come. Everyone is making sacrifice for this nation. Heaven is recording it. America will be saved. America will be captured. America will be taken away from the hands of the devil. We will survive. We shall prevail in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Amen. So, I want you to sing the song about America. I gave the testimony today. And then after that, we will li listen to her. And she will lead us to pray also. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll just hand the service to her. And she will lead us to pray. This nation will never be the same. Amen. Tell your neighbor, America will never be the same. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worship team. She needs to sing that song, so you need to come and play. Hallelujah. So after, we we'll will stand up together, sing with her, and then after that, Dr. Laura will just come up, since I've already introduced her. Open the door, America. It's a brand new day for you. Dora America, it's a brand new day for you. Open the door, America, it's a brand new day for you. Open the door, America, it's a brand new day for you. I am your king, your God.
glory. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. What a blessing that it is to be here with you. And uh, let's just thank the Lord for this very opportunity to be here together. So, Lord, we praise your name. We glorify you. We worship you. We honor you. We declare that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And we thank you that your throne is being established in our land, Lord, in ways that it has not been established for a long while. Lord, we, we honor you. We bless you. We thank you, God. We thank you for this time. We thank you for these people who are sacrificing and offering a great gift to you. We love you, Lord, and we say, come, Lord, be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Wow. <laughs> I am just uh, almost, I can't be speechless because <laughs> I've got the microphone, so I have to say something, but I am just really touched to be here, and uh, I'm from Kentucky. Yeah. We've already <laughs> um, we've already established today that you all have accents, but I don't, and so anyway, what a blessing it is to be here, and I've been watching online every night, but it's not the same as being here because you are offering a sacrifice to the Lord that I, laying on my couch or laying in my bed, am not offering the same sacrifice to the Lord. And I just want to know who's been here every, every time so far. Would you stand up if you've been here every single time? I just want to applaud you and just honor you in the presence of the Lord because the sacrifice, you may sit down, the sacrifice that you are giving is worthy to be noted. And if you've been here most nights, praise the Lord and God is with you as well. But, you know, it's costing you something to be here. And I had someone ask me the other day, he said, do you think this is um, of the spirit or do you think this is of the flesh? And I said, there's no way this is of the flesh <laughs> because people who are in the flesh don't hold in to do this because it costs too much. This is spirit driven in the name of Jesus. And you are offering a great sacrifice unto the Lord. And one of the things that just, this isn't where I was going tonight and I'll get back to where I was going, but I do want to, um, talk to you about Gideon just for a minute because um, so many times we see that there are two battles for the victory. You get the victory, but then you have another battle where you keep the victory. And so you've, you've had a victory, but you, ha you are now battling to keep the victory that you, have already, that you already have even by being here, uh, Bishop Robinson. So there are two battles going on, and we see that with Gideon. Gideon started off, and, and the Lord gave him the first victory. And he kept, paired his army down to 300, and then they went, and the Lord handed him the victory on a silver, silver platter. And um, so then he had sent all those people away. They were fearful. They didn't drink water the right way. And so then he called them back. And one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is... Judges 8, 4, and it says, And Gideon came to the Jordan, crossed over, he and the 300 men who were with him, exhausted but yet in pursuit, weary but in pursuit. And so there is something that honors God to be weary but still in pursuit. So as you are in pursuit, you are in pursuit of a great victory for our nation, and for you all as well. You, there is a promotion that is coming in the Spirit of God because of the fact that you are offering such a great sacrifice to the Lord. And he, it, is, it has been noticed. It has not been unnoticed in the name of Jesus. And the Lord has seen what you're offering. And as I'm looking here 
And I know there are a lot of people who are um, not, uh, have been born in other countries. So if you were born in another country, would you also raise your hand? If you're born somewhere besides the United States of America, would you just stand up? Thank you very much. Okay, you may sit down. <clears throat> Praise the Lord that there are people who understand just exactly what the bishop said, that we're not just fighting for America and the restoration of holiness in America. We are really fighting for the world. And as we go, so goes the world. And we... We are in this place where if we do not get a hold of where we're going, we are in serious jeopardy. I'm talking about all of us. And I had a dream. I woke up this morning. I left my home this morning a little after 4. I got up at 3.20 this morning and uh, to go catch the plane to get here. And last night I thought, that wasn't a good plan. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. I didn't think that one through. But um, anyway, as I, I had uh, woke up when the alarm went off about 3.20 this morning, I woke up and I was fairly well exhausted because I had had this dream. And even though I'd only been asleep for a few hours, the dream had gone on for at least 8 or 12 hours. I mean, it was one of those dreams where you just are always behind. You're never where you're supposed to be. You're fighting to get there, and everyone's gone ahead. And it was a dream that just, I, I really literally woke up exhausted. So I went into um, my, the bathroom of my house, and I, was, I got my phone out. I thought, I have to record this dream while it's fresh. And so I recorded the dream, and it left me... It left me with a little fear and trepidation. And when uh, Bishop called me and asked me if I would come here, um, I instantly felt the Spirit of God on that, and I knew that I needed to be here. Um, and actually, we had a death in the family. My husband went to the funeral today, and I came here because I felt that this was the place that I needed to be. Amen. But um, I realized even today that the Lord has been speaking to me about this for at least two or three months. And, wow. and after the request came in, the Lord really started speaking to me about it. So I have a big assignment of a lot of things that the Lord has specifically said that I am supposed to bring. And so um, we'll just work through those uh, tonight and Monday to the best of our ability. And um, I, will, I will speak them all, but I hope I get to talk about them as well. But um, one of the things that the Lord really has be, really been talking to, him, talking to me about personally is repentance. Yeah. And I know that repentance has already been a big theme of what has brought here. I've been watching, I've hear, I'm hearing people talk about repentance. I know that this is something that is on the heart of the Lord, but I want to just talk about it from a little bit different angle tonight. Two things the Lord showed me about repentance. One is repentance is not the end. We are not repenting to repent. We are repenting to get beyond repentance to the restoration of righteousness so we can walk in the power that God has for us to walk in. Because sin makes us weak. It makes our body weak. It makes our spirit weak. And it makes us weak. And last night when I tuned in, I heard Bishop Fondon say, why does the... Why do the Satanists have more power than the body of Christ? That is a question for the ages because we have the ability to walk in power Amen. and to defeat the forces of darkness. So why aren't we? And so that's what I, one of the things that I want to talk about tonight. So, you know, the Lord wants me to talk about fear of the Lord and maybe tonight, maybe another time, but... Definitely this weekend, um, the mind of Christ, mindsets, unholy mindsets. And I think that's ultimately where we're going. I'm just sort of giving a little roadmap. We're going to talk about mindsets, the mind, 
believers having the mind of Christ, but everybody that is not a believer having an unholy, ungodly mindset that lets them look at a scenario and see one thing when we look at it and see something completely different. How is that? And how it's because there is an apprehension of the mind and it is not just individuals. I mean, it is across broad segments of the population that there are mindsets that are unholy and ungodly. So we have to have a strategy to know how to deal with those unholy mindsets. Amen. You know, we don't want to go off and leave people in that place of brokenness. We want to win the election, but really what we want to do is see the enemy influence on a huge segment of the population broken so those people know who Jesus Christ is and they walk in the fullness of what God has called them to be. And, and it, it's about our identity. What is our identity in Christ? When we know who we are, we walk in that power because we know who we serve and we know what our call is. We, every person in here, every person watching needs to know, and if you don't know, ask the Lord, what is my call? What is my identity? Who am I called to be before the throne of God? And how is it that I am going to serve you? Because when you know what your identity is, you will stand up and you will square your shoulders when the attack comes and you say, no, not on my watch. I'm not taking it in Jesus' name. It brings me back to Gideon because Gideon had to go on the offensive again. He went, God handed him the first victory on a silver platter. But what happened with the second victory is that Gideon, and, I, and honestly, I didn't read this today. This is, wasn't even on my radar screen, but we're going with it for a moment. Gideon, weary but still in pursuit, crossed over the Jordan River. There had been, I think, about 150,000 men in the opposing army, and after the first battle, there were still, I think, 15,000. And so there were still a lot of people who were left to fight against Gideon and his armies. And so Gideon says, okay, everybody come back. We're going in pursuit. And what happened next is the opposing army, the Midianites, they sent out their princes. And this is what a story of what the enemy does. The enemy will send out the princes first because they don't want to give up the kings. They're going to send out the low-level people, the low-level demons first because they don't want to give up the high-powered ones. And so they sent out the princes, and the princes were dispatched. And Gideon could have said, like we often do, oh, well, we've had our victory. We're done. We're going home. But Gideon did not do that. Gideon said, no, we are not stopping until we get the kings. And so he, he kept pursuing until they had the kings. And the kings were dispatched, and it said Gideon had for, uh, peace on all sides for 40 years. So when we realize that there is more than one battle, then we will keep fighting until we get the ultimate victory over the kings. <clears throat> so what would have happened, in my opinion, and it's nothing but a speculation, but what would have happened if they had sent out the princes and they said, okay, we're done, we're going home. Those kings would have regathered, they would have regrouped, and they would have come back. And there would not have been peace on all sides for 40 years. It may have taken some time, it may have taken some time, but they would have come back and it would have been constant battle that we see in so many other times in Scripture. Because we have to know one, Gideon, okay, back to Gideon, even his call. Have you ever read that in Judges chapter 6? I love this <laughs> because I just want to, uh, to have, have you listen to this. And this is, this is Judges 6 um, starting around verse 12. And I want you to listen to this conversation because the angel of the Lord 
and Gideon are talking to each other, but they are not talking to each other. They are having two separate conversations. And the angel of the Lord is not hearing anything Gideon's saying in terms of his negativity and his failure to recognize his identity. So the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. So that's what he said. Let's keep going. And Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, wah, 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 why then has all this happened to us? And where are all of his miracles which our fathers told us about? And did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? And now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Can it get any more whiny than that? Let's keep going. So he didn't hear what the angel of the Lord said. The angel of the Lord didn't listen to Gideon. He turned and said to him, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So listen to the next thing Gideon said. So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. So they're having this conversation, but they're not listening to each other. And praise the Lord, the angel of the Lord did not take Gideon's rejection and his weakness, and he just kept saying no. And then we won't read any more of it right now, but basically what happens is the angel of the Lord says, go down and listen to what they're saying about you. And he goes down there and he overhears the opposing army talking about this barley loaf that's Gideon and they know they're destroyed. But he didn't take it from the Lord. He had to hear it from the mouths of the enemies. He did not know who he was. And I don't want to be in that position and I don't want you to be in that position that if the Lord is saying something about you and calling out your identity that you're arguing with him and saying, no, not me in the name of Jesus. So I wasn't going there. So I'm, I'm going to talk about repentance and why I think it's important. Gideon may have needed to do a little repenting on that. <laughs> you know, but the Lord was faithful and Gideon, he ultimately got it. He figured out who he was, and he stepped into it, and he had the victory. And he had the victory not only for himself, he had the victory for Israel. And so we have to realize we're Gideons in many ways. We're little unknown people. That's they were talking about the people that had been in the room that I'm staying at the hotel. And I said, and Laura Harris. And I'm thinking, you know, who is Laura Harris? You know, and I, th I was just praying to the Lord. I thought, Lord, I don't even, I mean, to you be the glory. But I mean, anyway. So, you know, we have to realize that the Lord can use us if we are willing and our yes has to be yes, no matter what yes is. We say yes to the Lord, and we do what he's called us to do. And so, okay, let me get on to repentance, because I do feel like this is important. I, uh, too many one, <laughs> too many revelations. I know, I had, I had one whole page. I'll, I'll show you, this is, this is the list of my assignments of things to talk about. <laughs> and so anyway, we'll get through it. We will get through it. And, I, and we're not going to be here till midnight either. But, um, <clears throat> but so um, I, I lead a ministry in Kentucky, and it's part of an international ministry. Uh, it's a GLOW International. It's in 170 nations around the world. It's an apostolic prayer ministry. It's... Uh, has a lot of different parts of it, but really governmental anointing is part of it. Equipping is part of it. Anyway, I say all that to say why I was doing one of the things that I was doing. As part of that ministry, one of the things that um, the Lord really had been speaking to me about was deliverance and healing and why is the body weak? Why are we weak? Why are we not being victorious when we stand up and something comes out of our mouth? Why, why is stuff not happening? And so 
anyway, I had started talking about the need to do deliverance, and it came up that we would enter into a study on deliverance. And so we got a book, and we were going through this book. It was women from a lot of different states, and we were um, just studying and learning about deliverance ministry. Well, the second chapter of the book was about repentance. And when I read the chapter, I got so excited because I saw beyond repentance. I think for the first time, I saw beyond repentance because so many times repentance seems to be the end and, and it's heavy. And I think people don't want to repent because they feel bad or they feel like they need to beat themselves up before the Lord or whatever, but that's not it at all. Do you know why the Lord wants us to repent? Because he does not want us burdened down by sin, weak and infirmed, where we cannot do the work that the Lord has for us to do. And so that's the bottom line, is that when we enter into repentance, we shore up our walls of righteousness, and those enemy arrows are not going to get to us. But when we have holes in our walls of righteousness because we have engaged in sin, then we're weak because the enemy arrows just keep hitting us and we can just keep knocking us when we're down. And <clears throat> so, I don't know, I started talk, thinking about David and I could tell you a lot about walls of righteousness. You see it all over scripture and I'm not going to get into all of that tonight because I think I just because of time. But, you know, we, we see there are hedges of protection, there are walls of righteousness you know, there is a blessing about being righteous before the Lord. It is a position of blessedness. It's a position of favor. When we walk in righteousness, when we are righteous before the Lord, there is provision, there is blessing, there is favor, there is promotion. There's all kinds of things, and we can dig it out in Scripture. But I started thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, about um, un the power of unrepentant sin. And, um, you know, who came to my mind was David, King David. And David sinned with Bathsheba. We all know that, and that was such a public sin. He tried to be in private, but, you know, the Lord did not let that remain in private. Uh, the Lord exposed that publicly for everybody to see, and we're still talking about it thousands of years later. We are still talking about the public nature of that sin. <clears throat> and I thought about David at the end of his life, and I thought, David did not finish well. And when you think about a lot of powerful, powerful men of Scripture, they did not finish well. Noah got drunk, did un other unmentionable things, did not finish well. Moses did not finish well, did not get to go into the promised land. Other powerful, powerful men of God, Samson, there were many who did not finish well, and they had been so mightily used of the Lord. So I'm speaking to leaders, and I'm speaking to all of the rest of us as well. This is a word of the Lord for the leadership in the body of Christ. Because I'm, I'll tell you, I'm a leader in the body of Christ. And when I sat down to engage in this exercise of repentance, I went back and I reread that chapter, but it took me three hours. And sometimes when we are dealing with holy things, we sort of get a blinder over our own eyes and think, well, that doesn't apply to me. And, you know, we can come up here and we can pray and repent, but there is no substitute for getting a notepad and sitting quietly with the Lord and saying, Lord, show me. Show me unrepentant areas in my life, open doors that are making me weak. And so I really want to encourage you, we won't do that tonight, but in the next 24 hours that you get before the Lord and you ask the Lord to show you areas that are not sanctified before Him. And when I did it, it took me three hours. And I think I am with the Lord every day. And I am doing ministry stuff every day. Almost everybody I talk to is in ministry in one way or another. So it's, this is for leadership that we come before the Lord and we 
we put ourselves out there and we say, Lord, I don't want to carry this stuff that's making me weak. And then we have to confess it. And, you know, we throw these words around too easily. Repent. We just throw that word around. We know what that means. We hear, we throw confession around. We know what that means. But you know what confession means in the Greek? Confession means I agree with it. So in, when you confess, you say, Lord, I agree. I'm guilty. You know, you don't try to explain it away. You don't try to gloss it over. You just say, Lord, I'm weak. I'm guilty. And you know what? The Lord can work with that. He can work with that humility when we say, I did it. He can do a major work of cleaning when we don't try to protect it from him. And then we renounce it, which we, at that point, just say, I'm done. I, I turn from my ways. I'm not doing that again. And then we're done with it. And so one of the things that I want to say is that when I went through that little exercise personally and did it, I felt such freedom. And I instantly started experiencing the favor of the Lord in ways that I had not experienced it in a long, long time. And so I talked to my husband. I said, Mike, I really think that you need to do this with me. And so he had, I had read the chapter to him, and then he got the book, and he read it, and then he went and sat with the Lord. And the same thing happened to him when he went through that exercise of really doing a deep dive into his soul to say, Lord, show me those places that are open doors. Well, he just started walking in such favor and blessing of the Lord. And in his work, I'm telling you, financially, there were, he's an attorney, and there were cases that were coming in every day that were, will generate a lot of revenue for God's kingdom. But it's not, it's not that, but it is that, because that is who we are in the kingdom of God. We're not broken down. We are not weak. We need to be in the position that we carry what God has us to carry, and we, as Bishop said, we send Satan back to hell. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. But I started thinking about David, and I thought, why did David end so poorly? And David, you know, he was such a virile man. He was such a man full of life. He was such a warrior, such a strong man, a good-looking man. And in the end, he couldn't even keep his body warm. They had to get a girl that he did not know just to lay with him to just keep his body warm. He was so infirmed at the end. I thought, Lord, how could that be? What happened to David? Even the Israelites walked out of Egypt, and there was not one sick or infirmed among them. So what happened to David that he was that weak and that infirmed? And I just started looking at David's life. And, of course, we know that he repented with his, for, for his sin with Bathsheba. You know, and I, and I looked at that. I think David had the lust of the flesh. He had the lust of the eyes, and he had the pride of life. You know, he was, his lust of his flesh was he didn't go to battle with his, his army he stayed, he pampered his flesh, and he sent other people to do his work. He had the lust of the eyes that he looked on another man's wife, and he had the pride of life that he was entitled to something that did not belong to him because of his position. So in the very next chapter, that, that all happened in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And then in 2 Samuel 13, do you know what happened in the next chapter? In the next chapter, we see that Amnon, the very next chapter, Amnon enticed his sister Tamar with David's consent, not to the, that act, but for her to come and be with him, and he raped her. And it was such a vile attack upon her because it was, it was angry, it was shaming, it was... It was disgusting because 
the way he treated her afterward. He, he put the blame on her for his vileness. And when you read that story very carefully, there was a Satan-like character in that. It was his first cousin. I think Jonadab was his name. And he was whispering in his ear, and he, he enticed him. He gave him the plan. You know, we have to be careful of the voices that we listen to. But when we see that David, he did not manage his household. And so he may have repented for his sin with Bathsheba, but he was never restored into his former glory because he did not deal with the sin of his household. And, you know, we can look at other places in Scripture, Hopney and Phineas, the sons of Eli, they were reprobates, they were womanizers, they were just all kinds of wrong. The whole house of Eli did not, and this is in uh, 1 Samuel 1, 2, and 3, did not stand through eternity and because the Eli did not take care of the sins of his sons. So here we see David did not take care of the sins of his son. And then he, Absalom was her brother, Tamar's brother. And then Absalom murdered Amnon, who perpetrated the rape on his sister. And then David didn't deal with him either. And then he, he got excommunicated, and David grieved over him, and they said, don't kill him. And then when he died, David grieved. He dishonored the men who were fighting for David's kingdom. And then there was another son, and his name was Adon, Adonijah. And he, he, um, you know, he tried to steal the kingdom out of David's hand while David was still alive. And then David took a census. You know, David just, he did not end well. And I, I was asking the Lord, what happened to him that he did not end well? And I think the reason he did not end well is before he was in the palace, he was talking to the Lord all the time. As a shepherd, he had a relationship with the Lord. When he was in the cave, he was asking the Lord, what do I do? Do I go up against the Philistines or do I not? Okay, and then, you know, he, do I go up against the Philistines? Will you give me victory? Yes, go up against them. I will give you the victory. Well, the next time it looks exactly the same, but did he take the previous answer? No. Lord, should I go up against the Philistines? And the Lord said, you shall not go up against them until you hear the sound of troops in the top of the mulberry trees. Amen. He asked the Lord every time for his marching orders. So somewhere in that cushiness of the palace and that pride of life and the lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh he lost his identity uh to the to the lord and he finished poorly and i just don't want us to finish poorly and this is i, I tell you when i had the dream in the middle of the night and i woke up it left me feeling um I woke, I woke up with this disquiet because I felt like it was for the body and I felt like it was for me. And another thing I didn't tell about that is I've had two dreams like that in the last week. And, and the dream was basically there was a royal wedding and I was, and I could tell you who it was, but I was a bridesmaid and I was out of place all day. I couldn't get there. I wasn't where I was supposed to be. I wasn't dressed when I was supposed to be. I couldn't get my clothes on. And, and I came back to the room, and everyone else had already gone. And then somebody came back to pick up something, and I said, can I go with you now? I'm almost ready. No, you can't go with me. And then, but I followed. I went anyway. And so then I saw the wedding planners, and I said, can I go in? No, you don't know where you're supposed to stand. You don't know what you're supposed to do. You cannot go in. And I went in anyway, and it was a giant room. And it almost looked like a, it was just a giant room with a wooden floor. And in the middle of the, of the floor, there were a few rows of chairs and there was a chair for every person that was in there. And so the bridesmaids were up in the front with the bridal party and the groomsmen. And I could look around and I could see like two chairs here, a chair there, two or three chairs here. And I knew when the bridal party got done, they were coming back to get those chairs. And I didn't have a chair. 
And then somebody from the front started yelling, Laura, Laura Harris, come up here, come up here. And I knew that I had already been uninvited. And I knew that it wasn't my place to go up there at that point. So I just sat in a chair that was not my chair. And then the room was huge, but there were very few people in there. And then way, way, way back, no more chairs, just wood floor, there was a balcony. And there were a few smattering of people in the balcony. And it was like, call somebody out. There's two worshipers. Those two are worshipers. They sing great. Bring your instruments down. This girl that was just a bridesmaid like I was, come on down. And the bride went over and she went, oh, this is so awkward. But there's no time for that now. You can't come. And the people that were on the way down from the balcony said, oh, we understand. We completely understand. And I woke up and I thought, oh, Lord. And that's the second dream that I've had like that in the last week. And it's like, Lord, what are you saying? And I believe that this is the time for the body of Christ to get it together and to be serious about getting our lives clean so we can carry what the Lord wants us to carry. We have to be ready. We have to be in this place where we are not weak. We're not getting pummeled all the time by the enemy, but we stand in the power of the, of the Most High God. We are His ambassadors, and I don't want to give the Lord a black eye because of my weakness. I don't want the, Lord, the people of the earth to say, who is this Lord of glory? How come His people are weak? How come his people are not walking in the power that he has for them to walk in? And I'm telling you, everybody from the smallest child to the most mature believer in here, we have access to that level of power. We need to be going to Walmart. We need to be at the gas station getting people healed. We need to be walking around looking for people to pray for, for deliverance and healing and set people free. So that we are doing the work on the planet. And the way I want to end this is that I don't want to stop in a place of brokenness. I don't want to stop in a place of feeling bad about ourselves because we are God's people. He loves us. And yes, we mess up. I mess up and I repent and I bring it back before the Lord and he loves me. And he, he, he pats me on the head and says, I'm his precious daughter. But you know what? There, here, here are just a few blessings that come when we walk in that place of righteousness. We dwell in the land Jeremiah 25, 5, we dwell in the land. And I'm going to go to Psalm 32. And Psalm 32 is a psalm of repentance. And they said, repent now every one of his evil way and his evil doings and dwell in the land that the Lord has given you, you and your fathers forever and ever. ever." Jeremiah 25, 5, we dwell in the land. We go to Psalm 32. Because there is so much in Psalm 32 about the blessedness of being forgiven. And so blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. You know what? We walk in the place of blessing, favor, and abundance when we are in that place. So I just go on down just another couple of verses on that. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. And um, I'm just going to go down to verse 6. For the call, for this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. And this is to acknowledge. We acknowledge fully and we agree fully in eight. Look, go to verse eight. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, and I will guide you with my eye. 
Amen. Amen. You know, the Lord instructs us. He teaches us. He guides us. He surrounds us. In Matthew 3, verse 8, it tells us to bear fruits worthy of repentance. Amen. Acts 3.10 it says that the axe is already laid at the tree of the root that does not bear good fruit. So we want to bear fruit worthy of repentance. We want to finish well. We want to finish well. Amen. I want to finish well. I don't want to be one of those, like one of those people in Scripture who served the Lord so valiantly but didn't finish well. So we just want to, uh, we want to have a time of prayer. Bishop asked me if I would take the offering, and I just don't want to stop and do that at the moment. And I want to go directly into prayer, but I'm going to ask if we just put a basket on both sides. And if you feel the calling of the Lord, and maybe we'll talk about it at the end, we want to just make it available, because this is part of worship. It's part of how we honor God so the work of the kingdom can go on. I'm just going to ask the musicians, sorry, the musicians to come, if you would. And we'll just play some music. Let's put them, all the, put them over on the sides. While they're coming, I'm going to tell you one more thing the Lord showed me about repentance. The Lord told me that repentance is like molting, molting. And I, and I, so I looked up molting on the Internet, and the first thing I saw was a snake going back and forth over rocks to, have you ever seen those snake skins? snake going back and forth over rocks to begin to knock that skin loose so he could go in tighter and tighter places for that skin to come loose so he could come out of it. And when he had not yet molted, there was no life to the skin. But after the molting, the skin was vibrant and puffed up. And so I looked at other things that molted, and one of the things, and you'll appreciate this here in crab country, but one of the things that I saw molting was a crab molting. And so a crab, when it molts, it, it takes hours. It takes a long time for the crab to extract itself from that hard, crusty shell that is preventing its growth. 
The sin in our life is like a hard, crusty shell that is preventing our growth. And when I watched that and saw the crab struggle to get shed of that, that shell, the crab that, was, that emerged that was standing on top of the shell that it had just come out of was double the size of the shell that it had come out of. And the same thing is true. I live in the country, so we have cicadas. They're, they're bugs that come out, and they have this hard, crusty shell. And you see those shells all over the trees. And so I watched a cicada molting. And so when the cicada molted and they, they worked again for hours to get free and they have to go through that, that struggle to get free of that hard, crusty shell, the cicada on top of that shell was about three times what had come out of the shell, the shell that it had come out of. And I'm thinking, this is a statement for us in the body of Christ that... That the sin is keeping us limited, keeping us from growing, and keeping us burdened down where we cannot be what God wants us to be. So as you think about this time of coming before the Lord and asking the Lord to help you finish strong, I want you to think about molting and getting rid of the hard crustiness that is preventing you from expanding who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. On the on the monitors you can see how you can give. And we just ask you to support this ministry and what the Lord is doing. This is changing many, many things in our world. It's very, very important ministry. Just, I, want, I just want to say the altar's open. If you need to come and do some work with the Lord, I invite you to come and do it. And I'm going to pray. Let me just pray. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for the blessing of restoring our righteousness. Lord, we see the blessing. We see the necessity of moving out of our sinful ways into this place of righteousness where we are impervious to the enemy attacks. So, Lord, come Holy Spirit. I'm asking you, Lord, would you speak to every person within the sound of my voice, every person in this room, every person online, Lord, every person who will ever hear this, would you speak to them, Lord, and begin to show those places deep within, maybe some of those places that have been pushed down for days, weeks, months, years, decades, Lord, we just we don't want people to be burdened with those things anymore. And I thank you, God, that you are showing your children even now those things which are hindering them and keeping them from being able to molt those hard, hard crusty shells. So, Lord, I thank you for come Holy Spirit. Thank you for blessing us and showing us, Lord, what you would have us to do. In the precious and holy name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. is open if you're coming to give or you're coming to lay down your life one more time we're calling for the refiner's fire it's to be holy